So we're in a series on prayer. And what we've said is that God wants a relationship with us, but you can't have relationship, any type of relationship, without communication. And we call that communication prayer. And so for the first part of this series, we're focusing on the part of prayer that's probably the most neglected, and that's how God speaks, how he speaks to us, and we need to be able to hear his voice. But a lot of people never hear him. That's what Denise was talking about. God spoke to her and said, be silent, just say this one word, and she heard. But most people never hear God. Why? One, they don't expect to. Another, they've never been taught to hear God. A third reason why is because they don't want to hear from God. they got stuff going on in their life, and they don't want God to get in their face about it. Uh, another big reason is because we fill our life with so much other noise, we can't hear his voice. But God wants us to hear him. And last week, we talked about probably the, the way in which we hear God the most, and that's through impressions of the Holy Spirit. But there are two dangers in that, two extremes. One is the rationalist who says, no, God doesn't speak. He spoke through his word. We can't actually hear his voice anymore. The other is the mystic that thinks every impression they hear is from God. And I feel sorry for both extremes because the rationalist who thinks God's spoken through his word, we don't hear his voice anymore. They never experienced God's comfort, God's guidance, God's care in their life, just hearing him come alongside and encourage them. But the mystic, I feel sorry for them because they think every voice they hear is an impression from God and they wind up doing stupid things making all these mistakes in their life and why not just messing themselves up. They'll come and say, God told me to do this. And next week, well, God told me to do this. And next week, well, God told me to do this. And they're all different things that contradict each other. Then you have, if it happens to the pastors, they get up in the pulpit and they say things like, God told me that somebody in the audience is going to give me a million dollars today. Now, I've had that vision. It didn't work out too well. But anyway... <laughs> But here's the thing. It doesn't matter which way people are in these extremes. They're both letting them, letting some, and we don't want to let some nut on either extreme keep us from experiencing God, from hearing his voice. Both extremes are wrong. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And we need to grow in our capacity to be able to hear God. David Wilson over here, he was telling me a couple weeks ago, yes, Mr. Blue Jeans, was telling me a couple, of, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago how when he was a kid, before there was TV, there was a radio program called Music Appreciation Hour. And kids would gather, this is back in the 30s, kids would gather around the radio... <laughs> Hey, he's got a good memory. He remembers this. Thing. They would gather around the radio and they would listen to music. And after the music was played, this famous conductor by the name of Walter Domrich would come on and explain to the children what they just heard. And he'd begin all his programs the same way. Good morning, my dear children. Well, all across our nation in assemblies, the, the, in the schools, they would come together in assembly and there would be this old guy on the stage and they didn't know who he was, but he'd stand up and say, good morning, my dear children. And then all the kids would stand up and applaud because they recognize his voice. We need, as God's children, to be able to recognize his voice. But we need to realize some things too. Number one, it's God's intention that we hear his voice because there are more than one voice to listen to. There's other voices in our culture. One of them is the voice of the enemy. Adam and Eve, right away, they begin to hear his voice. He comes to Eve and says, look, go ahead. Take this fruit. It's good for you. It'll taste good. He appeals to her physical senses. It's good to eat. He appeals to her intellectually. He says, it's going to make you wise. He appeals to her to emotionally. You're going, you're going to be like God. You're not going to be just nobody else. You're going to, to be like God. And Satan comes today and whispers to us. 
And he can make things sound so appealing. He can make materialism seem like a good thing. Oh, you want a house like that? It'll just cost you some time and integrity, but you can get a house just like that. He'll make affairs look appealing and sound good. A lot of you remember Hugh Hefner. He was 75 years old, had a 25-year-old girl on each arm. And you think, whoa, man. And women, back when Demi Moore was 42, her third husband was 27, looks a lot better than your fat, bald husband, doesn't he, right? And so he can make that look so appealing. He can make doubt look intellectual. Oh, I know a lot of people believe that the world was created in just six days, but we can be a little more open-minded than that. And people will look and go, oh, man, they're so open-minded. Oh, we just praise him for that. And they can make doubt look appealing. Can make selfishness look good. You've been sacrificing for yourself your whole life. It's about time you start looking out for number one, isn't it? Gossip. Oh, next time you get together, you let them know you're going to share something, but let's keep this confidential, and they'll lean in, and you'll have everybody's ear. See, Satan doesn't tell us the truth. It's a voice that we hear, and he made things sound so appealing, but he doesn't tell us the truth. He didn't tell Eve, look, you eat this fruit, you're going to be separated from God. In fact, you're going to spiritually die, and you're going to be kicked out of the garden, and you're going to be at odds with your husband. You're going to have pain in childbirth. One of your kids is going to grow up and kill your other kid, and your body's going to just get weak and, and weary and broken, and, and you're going to die. He doesn't say that. Here's what we read in, in Matthew when anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. So in other words, what Satan does, he doesn't want you to hear the word of God. Because what does he do? He deceives, he lies. Why? In order to destroy you. But his isn't the only voice that we hear, is it? There are other voices that we hear. There's the voice of self. You see, all my issues doesn't come because I've listened to the evil one. Sometimes it comes because I've listened to myself. Here's what we read in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. See, nobody can lie to me like I can lie to myself. It's not that my heart's always wrong or that my heart's always right. It's my heart's so inconsistent. I can't trust it. That's what is meant in Proverbs where it says, do not lean into your own understanding. In other words, don't trust your heart. Trust God with your heart. Sometimes it's the voice of self that will mess me up. And here's the thing. We have the capacity to listen to more than one voice. Remember these words of, in Scripture. Jesus says uh, uh, about Peter says, but you, he asked him, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. In other words, Peter, you didn't come up with this on your own. You heard the voice of God. God spoke to you and you articulated the voice of God. Then right after that, Jesus starts talking about how he's going to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter says, God forbid it that should happen to you. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So he had articulated the voice of God, then turns right around and articulates the voice of Satan. So we hear these voices. We hear the evil one. We hear the voice of self. And there's other voices that we listen to. So here's the question that we have to ask. How can you be sure you're hearing the voice of the Lord? How do you know whose voice that you're actually hearing? And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do you know you're hearing the voice of God? Number one is simple. Know your Bible. Because if you know your Bible, you know there's things that God will say and things God will not say. Because he's never going to tell you something contradicts with his word. It's like your parents, your mother, 
There are some things you knew you would never hear your mother say. Like, why are you sitting so far away from the TV? I used to skip school a lot when I was a kid too. Or let me smell that shirt. Yeah, you're good for another week. (laughs) You don't have a tissue? Just use your sleeve. Or how about this? If Timmy or Timmy's mom says it, go ahead and do it. It'll be just fine. I don't care. Or listen to your father. He's brilliant. Whatever he says, do that. No. (laughs) No. There are some things you knew your mother would never say. Same with God. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to go marry this 18-year-old bimbo. That's not what he would say. But anyway, that's what was going on in my mind when he said that. And I go, wait a minute. And he would say this. He had this. I believe that's what God wants me to do because God wants me to be happy. Yeah. You've heard him too, huh? I say, wait a minute. God, who said breaking the marriage covenant is something that he hates, but he said, in your case, it's okay? That's what you're telling me? If you want to be sure you're hearing God, know his Bible, because there's things you know God would never say. But there's some things also you know God would say. Here's the second thing. The voice of the Lord will uplift me. It will lift me up. Paul was in Corinth, and he's under a lot of pressure there. There's a lot of opposition to the gospel. And here's what we read. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half teaching the voice, teaching the word of God among them. So he's going through this time of of oppression, and he's getting down, and God speaks to him this word. He didn't speak to him every day, but he spoke to him then, and he went on for another year and a half. See, God's not going to speak to you to make you weary, to make you worry more. When he speaks to you, it's going to give you peace. It's going to give you faith. It's going to build up your courage tank. The next thing, the voice of the Lord will convict you in order to correct you. And this is important. We miss this a lot. Here's what we read in Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. In other words, when God speaks to you, he's never going to say anything that's going to put you down, that's going to cause you to doubt your identity. He's going to build up your identity, who you are in Christ. He's not going to come and try and tear you down. He's going to build you up because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So when we sin... We hear different voices. How many of you, when you sin, you hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Usually the Holy Spirit is on, is on, is on us before we sin. Say, no, don't do this. It's not right. It's not good. This is not going to be good for you. This is going to lead you down the road. You don't want to go down. Don't do this. It's, it, God has your best interest at heart. That's why he doesn't want you to do this. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, man. And it's amazing how quick Satan changes his tune when we do sin. Because before we sin, Satan's saying, Ah, oh, do this. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. You deserve it. Everybody else is doing it. You can handle it. I know other people, other Christians, they might can, not can handle this, but you can handle it. You can do this. And as soon as we sin, what does Satan do? Oh, man, you've got to be the worst Christian ever. You are just pitiful. How could you do something like that? Oh, wait a minute. This is the first time you've done it. You've done it time and time again. Why don't we just count those times all the time you've done this? You're so out with God. God doesn't want to have anything to do with you anymore. You're not just out with God. What if somebody else finds out what you did? Ooh. Then it's really going to be bad. Then they're going to be on you about it. You see, when we sin, we hear two voices. The voice of Satan, he wants to start with what you did and then tear down who you are. 
the Holy Spirit wants to start with who you are and then help you rebuild and change and repent of what you did. You see, Satan will come along and say, you're worthless. How did you do something like that? Can't believe you did that. The voice of the Holy Spirit will come and say, you're God's. You've been chosen. You've been forgiven. You're his for all eternity. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to behave like somebody who you're not? See, Satan wants to condemn you. He wants to cut down who you are. But the Holy Spirit wants to come along and, and, and convict you, but it's, a, it's conviction that goes deep into the soul. He wants you to, 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 to know who you are in Christ, but to deal with the dirt in your heart that caused you to do what you did. And when Satan, when you hear the voice of Satan, you know it's the voice of Satan, because what's he going to say? Oh, man, I can't believe you did that. And don't you dare let anybody else know that you've done that. Let's just keep that a secret. Because if they know what you did, they're going to be on your case. People are going to be talking about you, bad-mouthing you, gossiping about you. So let's just keep this a secret. But the voice of the Holy Spirit will say, no, you need to get this out in front of a, a few people who love you and have your best interests at heart. Because as he says in James, if we confess our sins, when we confess our sins, what? He says, confess your sins and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Get it out there. Whenever you sin and, and your first reaction is, oh, I hope nobody else knows. I want to keep this a secret. That's not the voice of God. In fact, there's more about confessing to other people in the Bible than there is about confessing to God. God, let's just keep this between me and you. Let me just tell you what I've done, and let's just keep it between me and you. We don't need to bring other people into this. And the voice of Satan, he's real general. You're no good. You're lousy. But the voice of the Holy Spirit, he's very specific. That was lust. That was gossip. And if you hear any, other, your, any voice in your life does, does, that does not express the love of God, that voice doesn't come from heaven. That didn't come from heaven. Next, the voice of the Lord will challenge you to step outside your comfort zone. See, the voice of self will always lead you to safety. Protect yourself. Don't let anything bad happen. Make sure you don't take too big of a risk in your life. But the voice of God will lead you to Get outside your comfort zone. We'll lead you to boldness. We'll lead you taking steps of faith. Oh, let's build the ark. Let's go face a giant. Let's get out of the boat and walk on the water in the middle of the storm. Let's marry a virgin who's pregnant. When Paul in Acts 21, he's on his way to Jerusalem with an offering, and he's taken up from the Macedonian churches for the Christians in Jerusalem because of the persecution in Jerusalem and, and they've been shunned and outcasts. It's, they're, they're just in big need. And so he's taking this offering to them. And on his way there, this guy from, from Agabus, he comes up and, and, and takes Paul's belt and binds himself with it. In fact, let, let's read what he says. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And what's behind this is Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. It's not going to be good for you there if you go. And this guy wasn't the only one saying this. We read this. When we heard this, both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. This is before this guy came up even. So there's a lot of people telling Paul, don't do it. Don't go to Jerusalem. Guess where he's going? To Jerusalem. So what's he doing? Is he disobeying the Holy Spirit here? Is that what's going on? No. Paul's not questioning their revelation 
He's not questioning this guy who comes up and prophesies and says, if you go here, this is what's going to happen to you. He's not questioning that. He's just in question their interpretation. Because see, what they're doing is they're saying, Paul, this is going to happen to you, so don't go to Jerusalem. That's their take. But Paul's different. Here's what we read. We sought out the disciples and stayed there seven days, though the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Okay, so again, he's he's reading this. He's hearing this. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia. And and we're backing up. Now we're in Acts 19. I'm sorry, I meant to, what's going on before this? And okay, and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it's necessary for me to to go to Rome as well. So Paul says, no, the Spirit's told me I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. This is, this is before this is taking place. So Paul is saying, look, I know what's going to happen. We read this. And now I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Paul says, I know when I get to Jerusalem, it's going to be difficult. The Holy Spirit told me that too. So what's going on here? God's obviously speaking to a lot of people about this. What's happening? They're saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul's saying, I know what's going to happen to me, and I'm going to Jerusalem. See, it's like that time when... Saul is chasing David. He's got his 3,000 men chasing David in the wilderness. And David's got a couple hundred men who's hiding in a cave away from Saul. And then while that's going on and and Saul's outside with all his men, Saul goes, goes to that cave that David and his men are hiding in to relieve himself. And all his men say, whoa, look what God has done for you, David. He's managed these circumstances to come out where you can kill Saul. It's easy. Just walk up to him. He never even know you're there. And you can kill him. And you can become king. And David says, no, I'm not going to lay my hand against God's anointed. See, it's one thing to believe in providence of God. It's another thing to be able to interpret it correctly. And David is not questioning all these that are coming in here and say, the Spirit told me this, the Spirit told me that. He's just correcting their interpretation. See, the way they're reading this is, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul says, no. That's not my interpretation. Here's what we read in verse 13. Then Paul replied, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart because they're crying. And Paul, don't go, don't go, don't go. For I am ready not only to, to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul said, just because there's danger in my future, tell me why I shouldn't step into that danger, step into that future. Because when I became a Christ follower, I knew what I was signing up for. I'm following some guy who died on the cross. I knew it was going to cost me. I knew the persecution was going to come. It wasn't going to be easy. See, this is surrender here in verse 13. Because the concern of everybody else, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. There's pain in your future. There's difficulty in your future. See, their concern is for Paul. But what's Paul's concern? It's for the mission that God's given him. And although they're begging Paul not to weep, he said, quit breaking my heart. God has led me to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. That's what's going to happen. See, it's not a prohibition, all these other people who are prophesying about this. It's it's a preparation, Paul's saying. God's just telling me what's going to happen when I obey him or what awaits for me. Oh, that we might be a people that would stop and listen to the voice of God and interpret it correctly. Ken Helser, he was in the music industry in the 60s. A hippie. Druggie. So one day in 1970, he's starting to smoke a joint and get high. And he hears a voice that says, hear God and you will live. And he goes, whoa. 
So he starts investigating. He goes to a church. Can you tell me how to hear God? You can't hear God. He goes to another church. Do you ever hear from God? No. Nobody hears from God. You can't hear God. He spends three months going from church to church trying to find out, how can I hear God? He goes to a Baptist church and he walks to the pastor and says, do you ever hear God? He says, yeah, I do all the time. He goes, oh, great. Teach me how to hear from God. He says, I can't because your idol is music. You surrender your life to Christ. You become a Christ follower. Then I can teach you how to hear God. And he does. He becomes an avid Christ follower. Now fast forward, he has two kids. And a school teacher named Kermit comes up to him and says, God's given me a word to tell you to encourage you. He says, I believe you're going to have a boy and you're going to name him Jonathan David. And that boy is going to be a mighty man and he's going to write music that's going to bless the whole world. But see what Kermit doesn't know is that Ken's wife has uterine cancer and she's scheduled to have a hysterectomy in two weeks. So he begins to pray. He goes to the surgeon and says, please perform another test before you do surgery, before you perform a hysterectomy, take another test, have another test done. He begs him and finally he says, okay. And the surgeon comes out after that and says, I've been doing this for 30 years. This is the first miracle that, the miracle that I've ever seen. There is no cancer. A year later, Jonathan David is born. First 19 years of his life, he has no interest in music at all. He just wants to play sports. No interest in music. And then he goes for a youth on mission to England. And he tells his dad before he leaves, can you loan me a guitar and teach me a few chords to sing? And he does. Three months later, Ken and his wife go visit their son, Jonathan David, in, in England, and they find out he's writing music for Christ. And he still is. One you've heard of probably, I'll raise a hallelujah. And one you sang earlier, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And there's a phrase in that that says, from my mother's womb, you have chosen me, and love has called my name. And now that, that little phrase may make a little more sense to you on why it's there. From my mother's womb, he's called me. He's chosen me. Love has called my name. See, the thing about hearing God is behind it is love. Behind it is his heart. And here's the thing. Here's what I got to give the warning of. You hear God and you fail to respond to that. God speaks to you and you just blow it off. You're going to become more insensitive and eventually incapable of hearing his voice at all. God speaks to you and tells you to do something and you just say, no, I don't think so. The next time, you're not going to hear his voice cry as strong. Next time, less and pretty soon, you won't hear it at all. Here's what we read in Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. And he reads this three times in this little section there. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Listen, God's speaking. And he may be telling you that you need to become a Christ follower. He may be telling you, you know, some way of getting out of your comfort zone to share Christ with that person at work. To, to start tithing or, or, or to, to, I don't know, to, to just some way. He may be speaking to you this morning. Don't put that off. And if he's telling you something this morning and your reaction is fear, well, congratulations. Now you know what's keeping you from growing in your Christian life is fear. you got something you need to deal with. Is it lack of faith? Congratulations. Now you know that you need to trust him, that he has your best interest at heart. Because love is calling your name for your best. Has your best interest at heart for this life and the one to come.
You just have a choice. Are you going to listen and respond, or are you going to grow a little more insensitive and eventually incapable of hearing his voice? So we're going to sing the invitation. I'm going to ask the guys to come forward. And as we do, it's very simple. What's God asking you to do? What's he saying to you? It could be that issue that your husband has, just be quiet about it. Let God deal with him. It could be become a Christ follower today. Maybe you're ready to, to, to be baptized, to follow him. I don't know what it is. But if you hear his voice, you'll know it's him as it corresponds with his word. You know it's him because he wants to build you up to encourage you, not to discourage you. You know it's him because he will bring conviction in, in order to, to see change in your life happening. And you know it's him because it will be a challenge. It will be something to overcome, to, to step out on faith, to be bold with. Listen, if you've never heard God challenge you, I got a question. Have you ever heard him at all? If the only time you've heard God's voice, or if you're thinking here and there, he's going to say, just, just play it safe, just, just back up. See, God's going to challenge you. He wants to see you step out and trust him. If your whole goal in life is to stay safe and secure and, and, and to, to make sure nothing bad happens and just put off your funeral as long as you can, you don't even need to hear his voice, do you? You're not on a quest. See, it's only when you're on a quest that, that, that leads you to, to change, to seeing things happen. That's why you need to hear his voice. You don't need any guidance in your life if you just want to play it safe and just let's put off my funeral as long as I can. There's no reason for you to need to hear him in that case. But God wants to do a work in you to take you where love can take you closer and closer to his heart. But that's only going to happen when you respond to his voice and quit being chicken. Oh, what do people think? I'll be so embarrassed. Well, now you know what the issue is. What's stopping you? Whenever your desperation factor exceeds your embarrassment factor, then you'll make a decision. When you come to that point where, God, I've got to have you, I want, no matter what, then, that'll over, then you won't care who sees or who says or, or what's going on. You just got to do it. And maybe that's you today. You just have to do it. Let's stand together as we sing.